and amen. Praise God. Amen. You may have a seat, please. If you have your Bible, please open it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have your Bible there with you. 2 Corinthians 5. Before we read it, just keep it open there. Pay attention for a moment. We, we are here to talk to you today about this idea of re rebuilding yourself. How, how does that work? What is that about? Can you rebuild yourself? And if you can, how? What is this idea to rebuild yourself? Of course, when we talk about rebuilding, it is implied that something was built, but for some reason, it's no longer working, it's no longer good enough, and needs to be rebuilt, right? So, if we're talking about rebuilding yourself, it is implied that something about your life is not good enough. The life you have, the person you are, is just not working for you as well as it should or the way you wish. And you would really like to be able to reinvent yourself, rebuild yourself from scratch. Make yourself a new person. Be better. Of course, you would like to make yourself a better person than you are today. For you to have an idea what that means, think about your home, your house, for a moment. Think about your house. I don't know if you live in a house, in an apartment. Most people here in New York live in an apartment. But whatever the place you live in looks like, let's say that you had the chance and the means to tear that place down and rebuild it the way you wanted it. If you had the means, the money to do it, the architect of your choice, the materials of your choice, the time necessary to tear that place down and rebuild it the way you need it, the way you would like it. First question, would you do it? Or would you stick to this place as it is? Would you do it? Okay. That sounds like a good proposition, right? And second, would you rebuild the same you have today or would you do it better? There's no question about it. Of course, there's no point tearing something down only to rebuild it the same again, right? So, if you had a chance to tear down your house and rebuild it, you'd probably do a better job you'd probably end up with something that is more suitable to you today, better quality, more comfortable, etc. You would do that. So if that is true about the place we live, how much more would that be true of our life itself, of the person we are? If we had a chance with the experience we have of this life today, if we had a chance to just wipe the slate clean, right? In other words, to just say, okay, I've had enough of this life as it is. I didn't make some good decisions in my past, you know, that have taken me here. I don't like where I am. I don't like the way my family is. I don't like the way my love life is, my finances, my career. I don't like many things about my life. I like some things here, but there are other things that I don't like. If I could just go back and start over and make myself a new person, I would like to do that. I think most of you would agree with this statement, right? We would all like to be better, to be different. And interesting, it's interesting that this idea is not some fancy idea that a person comes up with, a human being comes up with. This idea originally started with God. You know, 
God wants us to rebuild ourselves. And He wants it so much that He gives us the tools to do it. The whole reason why God sent His Son to this world, the whole reason He came up with the plan of salvation was because He saw that the way people are born in this world, the way we, we grow up, the way we live our lives, we are wrecked from day one. We live wrecked lives. We live lives where we are influenced by our, our parents. We are influenced, influenced by the society where we grow, grow up in. We are influenced by the world, by the culture of the world, by all the systems that we are inserted in the world, be it political, educational, cultural, religious. We are all a product of this messed up world. Or do you think the world is in a pretty good shape? No, the world is messed up. And we, are, we were born into this mess. Therefore, like it or not, we are a product of this mess. Many of us carry inside scars and wounds from things we went through in our childhood, traumas. For example, I had in my family, in my teenage years, I became suicidal because my parents broke up and, and because my dad cheated on my mom. And that was terrible, very, very bad for me. I really wanted to die because I grew up having my dad as my hero and all of a sudden I discovered that he's no hero. He, he was cheating on my mom. And these things, they scar you, they, they damage you. And I'm sure many of you here have even a lot worse stories to, to talk about from childhood and even young, young years or adult life. We are all, in fact, very, very much uh, pounded upon. We are hit very hard. The world does a number on, on us. And a lot of us grow up angry, upset, skeptical, hating people, hating the system. We grow up, some of us, doubting the existence of God because we, we hear about God since we are kids and then we look at the world the way it is, we look at our lives and we wonder, okay, if God is, is there, then why are things like this? And basically our lives are wrecked from the cradle all the way to the grave. And because of this condition, because of this, this fact, then God decided that He would give us the opportunity to rebuild ourselves, to start a new life. That was the whole idea, the whole proposal of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look in 2 Corinthians 5, he, he, it's, Paul is talking exactly about that. It says, Verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So in other words, you see that when the Lord Jesus came, to this world. His, one of his goals, of course, his ultimate goal was to rescue us, our souls from sin and give us eternal life so we can live with him forever. That was, that was and is his ultimate goal. But he knew that we have a time to pass, to spend here on earth. Before we go to heaven, even after we accept Jesus here in this life, we have some time that we need to spend here. We are not of the world, but we are in the world. We are in this mess. So, what is his solution to this messy world for the people who believe in him, for the people who accept him and still 
have to live here before they join him in heaven. The solution is, he says, I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to make you a new person. I'm going to make your life so new that people who know you after I'm, I'm done with you, they will not recognize you. You will be a new creation. It will be like your old life was some distant memory. And your new life is something that people look at and say, wow, what happened to you? You're so different. Because God will transform who you are. He will change who you are from inside and also outside. He will change who you are. That was his proposal. That's his idea. I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to make you a new creation, a new creature. You're not going to be just some better version of your old self. You know, you come to church and now suddenly you don't smoke anymore. You perhaps don't drink anymore. You don't swear anymore. But overall, you're still that same old guy or that same old person you've always been. No. He's not talking about making you a better version of yourself. He is talking about making you a totally new person. You know, sometimes he uses the word born again, reborn, meaning that you have to, you, you will die to that old life, you will die to that old person, and be born a new person, totally different. He uses different terminology, but basically this, the idea is the same. I'm going to make you a new person. And this is this idea of rebuilding yourself. God wants us to rebuild ourselves. And He gives us the tools to do it. This is the whole idea, this is the whole proposal in God's words. So, of course, the question is, how does that happen? Is it something involuntary? Is it something that we have no control over? That there is nothing we can do to provoke it? We, can, we should just wait for God to do that in us. Is it something that happens to some lucky people? That you've probably seen people give testimonies, people who were you know, criminals or they, they were abused when they were kids and they lived this horrible life and then suddenly they have this encounter with God they are transformed they become successful they get married now they are motivated they are become they become motivational speakers they make a movie about their lives are these people lucky has God just been so generous with them and they are some of the few him whom he chooses to do that for no that's not something that happens to a few lucky people. That is involuntary. If it were, then it wouldn't be fair. It is something that is totally in your control, in your ability to do, because God gives you the tools to rebuild yourself. Rebuild yourself. In other words, you can understand this also as something that it is done by you. Of course, with God's help, using His tools, but it's basically done by you. It is provoked by you. You have to rebuild yourself. And how does that happen? How does God help someone rebuild themselves? How, what are the tools that God gives us to rebuild ourselves? I, I would like to, to focus on two main tools that God gives us. Two principal tools. Very important tools available to you right now for you to rebuild yourself. The first tool is called the power to decide. God has given the human being something that even he does not meddle or interfere with to change, to overrule it. Which is the power to decide what we want. God wants everyone to be saved, but He gives them the freedom to decide whether they want to spend time with, spend eternity with Him in heaven, or if they want to spend eternity away from Him. That's the power God gives people to decide. If He had it His way, everybody would spend eternity with Him. Right? 
Do you believe? Everybody would be with God. If God had it His way, everyone in the world would believe in Him. Everyone in the world would obey Him because that's what He wants. But unfortunately, that's not what everyone wants. Not everyone wants God's way. Not everyone wants to be restricted by God's words. They want to do what they want to do. So that's their power to decide. And that's something that God will not take away from you. He will let you make your choices and live with the consequences. But the good news about that is that if God cannot interfere with your choices, neither can the devil. If the devil is holding you down, is holding you hostage, if the devil has ruined your life, if you have suffered so much under the hand of evil in this life, if you decide that you're going to change who you are, that you're going to change the life you live, and you decide this today, the devil cannot stop you. Your past cannot stop you. Because your past does not interfere does not, it may make it a bit more difficult, no doubt, depending on the past you have, where you're coming from, but your past is not an absolute limitation to whoever you want to become. It's not, because you have this power to decide what you want to be. I ask you, if, if we have a prostitute over here, she's lived her whole life selling her body, being abused by men. She had no family. But if she hears the word of God today and, and she says, I am no longer going to sell my body. I will starve before I sell my body again. I will find a way, another way to live a life worth living. I will change my, my life. Can she do that? Is it going to be difficult? No doubt. No doubt because if she doesn't know another life, it may be very difficult. She may suffer a lot of discrimination, a lot of rejection from people, etc., etc. But that's, that's difficult but not impossible. It's all up to, to her decision. She has to make that decision. She has to decide. And no one can make that decision for her. You know, if that person is a family member, if that's a sister, if that's a daughter, you are a father, you are a sister, your family, you, you may bring that person to your house, give her food, give her a job. You can, you can say to her, look, I'm going to take care of you. I want you to have a new life. I'm going to pay for school for you to go to. But if she doesn't want that, it's useless, all the help you can give. She has to decide for herself. That's something that God gives us as a tool to rebuild our lives. You have to make those decisions yourself. If you want to rebuild your life, you have to start by using this tool called decision. You have to decide on the things that need to change immediately in your life. Let's say, for example, you're a husband and your marriage is terrible, is hanging by a thread. And it's hanging by a thread because you have a past of cheating on your wife. You have a, a porn addiction. You, you, you don't pay attention to your marriage. You pay more attention to your friends than you pay attention to your wife. Okay. So you're, you're up against a, a big challenge, I would say. Your wife is all but giving up on you already. If you want to change who you are, you need to start by making a decision. You need to say, I am no longer going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to be a man of only one woman. I will beg her forgiveness. I will cut off all relationships I have with other women from my past. I will give my wife all the access to my cell number, to my email, to my Facebook. I will live a transparent life so that my life my wife will not have to wonder where I am, with whom, doing what, ever. I will start being that kind of man from now on. I will 
give up the internet porn. I will put the computer in the living room where when I use it, my wife is present and I will put anti-porn software on my computer. I will only use this computer for work and nothing else. You will decide that you will leave your friends, perhaps meet with them just once in a while and prioritize your wife. Turn to your wife. Listen to her. Care about her. Deal with the problems, the complaints that she's been telling you for 20 years and you've been ignoring. All these three things depend on one single decision that you make about each. Each of these decisions are within, uh, is within your reach tonight. You don't have to do anything physically. You don't have to wait for anything. For you to make those decisions. You can make them right now. Okay, your life is not going to change the minute you make that decision, but you will start changing the minute you make that decision. The minute you make that decision, you are tearing down that old, adulterous, porn addict man, unatten unattentive man. You are tearing him down and you are beginning to rebuild a faithful husband who cares about his wife, who is faithful and who understands the stupidity of porn. So you can do that. And if you do it, that's the day, that's the moment that you start rebuilding yourself. You make that decision. You know, the word decision comes from, from the, 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 the idea in the word means you cut off everything except one. That's, that's the meaning of the word decision. You have to cut off all the other options and stick to one. When you make a decision, that's what you do. You cut off every other alternative, every other option you have, and you stick to one thing. That's when you make a decision. So a decision involves cutting off certain things from your life. Right? You can't change your life. You can't rebuild your life unless you make some sacrifices. Unless you let go of certain things and you focus on the ones that will bring you the results you want. Are you following? So that's one tool. The, one of the, the main tools God gives us to rebuild ourselves is the power to decide. Now the second tool, I told you there are two, the second tool is, I would say, I call it the power to dare. Which is basically the tool of faith. The power to dare means you decide to be bold about the changes that you go for in your life. You decide to use your faith, meaning that you step out of who you are, where you are, and what you are used to. And you reach for things that are new, that are more challenging to you, that are more wor worthy of your efforts to attain. You step out of this comfort zone and you start daring to go for new things. So for example, let's say that you are a single woman and you are in your 30s, you're in your 40s, and you haven't had much luck in your love life. Very well. You're trying to rebuild yourself. Your new self, you see your new self as a woman who is wanted by a worthy man who is going to honor you and who is going to marry you. Very good. Okay. But the problem is that you look around you and you don't see that man yet. Right? You don't see <laughs> any worthy man. According, at least your old self doesn't see that. All right. So, God gives you the power to dare for you to do some new things. Right? For you to become someone you're not. Someone better than you are right now. So, a lot of, a lot of women, for example, they have this, this very negative self-image where they don't take care of their appearance. Where... 
if um, maybe they have not only self, bad self-image, but they have a very bad image of men in general, because of this wrecked world we live in, has, because this world has given the message to women that men are all the same. They only change address. Right? <laughs> Basically, that's, the, that's a message that is coming out of movies and, and the culture in general, right? Men are pigs. All men want is sex. You know, men are, are, are just, you know, they, they are not worth your, your, worth your time. So this idea, this image that you have of, of men, coupled with perhaps a very bad image you have of yourself, causes you to do what as a single woman? Causes you to not look at men, not pay attention to men, to have evil eyes, even towards men who might be a good candidate to marry you, to be a good husband. You perhaps do Unconsciously, you do something with your image, with your appearance that puts men off. Or maybe that attracts the wrong kind of men, the wrong kind of attention. Instead of valuing yourself as a woman of God and dressing accordingly and taking care of your body accordingly, taking care of your, of your looks accordingly, of the way you speak, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself. Instead of doing those things, you do the opposite. You're very brash. You're very abrasive. If, if a man looks at you, you say, what are you looking at? <laughs> you give off that vibe that you're, you're walking around with, with barbed wire all around you. And of course, that's not going to help your situation very much. But with this tool that I'm talking to you about, the power to dare, the power to step out in faith, the power to, to go for those things that God has said are yours by right, such as a good marriage, such as becoming a virtuous woman, becoming a, a, a woman who, who has value. You, despite your past, despite who you've been, what the world has told you, what your mom has told you, despite your past, you dare to go for that kind of woman, to become that kind of woman. And you start taking little actions that will do that. Maybe you, you're going to do something about your weight. Maybe you're going to do something about your looks. Maybe you're going to do something about the volume of your voice because you, you speak perhaps in a very aggressive way. Perhaps you're going to be a little bit more open to accept friendship. I wouldn't say even uh, an invite to a date, but initially you, would, you might become more open to become friends with with members of the opposite sex that might become someone in the future that interests you. Are you following me? You dare to do these things. You, you take action and you start becoming this person because you believe God can change you into that person. You are not, by God's grace, by God's power, you are not stuck with the person the world has made you be. You're not stuck with it. You have a choice. You can dare and be different. You can dare and change. Now, I'm giving you this example of, of this single woman and, and, and love life, but this applies to any area of your life. Maybe talk about your finances, for example. I've seen countless examples of people who worked for others all their lives. They made their bosses rich. They were faithful employees, and they were getting older and older, and they reached that ceiling, that salary ceiling, that no matter how hard they worked, they would never get paid a cent more. Until one day that they decided to dare. Until one day that they woke up and said, okay, I know most things about this business, my boss relies on me for almost everything here in this, in this place. Why don't I do this for myself? Why don't I start working for myself? And they dared. Even though their friends and colleagues 
warned them and said, you're crazy, you know, being your own boss is very hard, you know, people can cheat on you, they can betray you, you hire people, then they steal from you. You know, they get all these kinds of negativity from, from their friends, but they started to believe and to dare. And today, they are very successful in what they do. They've become what they thought they never could, what people thought they never could. And do we have grounds in God's Word to believe that? Of course we do. We have, of course we have grounds because it is the Word of God that says you shall be head, not tail. Right? It's God who says, I will put you at the top and never at the bottom. You will lend to people, not have to borrow from anybody. In other words, God's plans for us are good, are for us to succeed. It's not for us to struggle, to, to have always trouble financially that we have to scrap the bottom of the barrel to pay our bills every time. That's not God's idea for us. But we have to dare and believe that these things are for us. We have to dare and believe, I can do that. I can become that person. So, you know what? Let me try. Let me do it. And then the little voice says, but what if you fail? So what if I fail? If I fail, I learn one way not to do it. And then I, I refine my attempt next time. Right? That's how you succeed. You fail, 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 fail until there's no way for you to fail anymore. And then you succeed. Because you failed at everything you could have failed. Now you know not to do these things. So there's only one more left. And you do it and you get to success. So you should not run away from failure. You should not be afraid of failure. Af afraid of, of trying. That's why I'm saying... God gives us the tool called the power to dare. You can dare. And for you to dare, sometimes when you dare, you get a few scratches, you, you, you stumble, you fall, people make fun of you. But at the end of the day, it's you who make the progress. It's you who make the change. And people will only be left with the choice of clapping their hands to, to you. Do you understand, friends? So what I am saying here to you is this. Okay, to recap what we said. Is it possible to start your life over? Yes. Absolutely. That's the whole idea why God came to this world. Why Jesus came to this world was for you to become a new person, a new creation. It is not only possible, it is His promise. It is His plan for you that you become a new person. Okay, so He gives us the tools. He gives us tools to do that. It's not something that happens by magic, involuntary, or by luck. It's something that is provoked, okay? It's done by us. We rebuild ourselves, okay? So, two tools he gives us to rebuild ourselves. One is what? We make the decision. That's down to us. God's not deciding for us. Nobody's deciding for us. We have to decide. The choice, the decision is ours. And the second tool he gives us is what? The power to dare. That's why he gave us faith. Faith is for you to see the invisible. It's for you to attempt what, humanly speaking, is impossible. But he gives you the promise that if you believe, all things are possible. If you have the faith, he will make the impossible possible for you. You need to use those tools. If you don't use those tools, forget about rebuilding yourself. You can pray your life to the grave. You're not going to become a new person. You have to use those tools. Now, I want to call you for a decision. A decision today, first of all, that you need to let go of this life that you have. A decision that you're going to let go of this life that perhaps even though it's bad, you haven't really decided to let go of you you are attached to it there's a strange thing about suffering and about a bad life it's that for some reason we are attached to it we feel attached to it have you noticed that you talk to a, a person who is addicted to drugs any kind of drugs and they know that drug is killing them they know but they can't stop using it Right? 
They can't. They, they don't want to let go of that. There's something in them that tells them, okay, the brain says, it's killing you. It's going to kill you. But they say, yeah, but I want it. Just one more. Just one more. So there is, there is this struggle in us that even though on one side we do want the new life, the brand new house, but we look at the old house and, and it's like that chipped cup. You know the chipped cup? Huh? You probably have a chipped cup in your cupboard. that You don't serve it to the guests, right? But you like it. It's your favorite. <laughs> you like it. Should- to drink, to drink out of that chip cup. Because maybe it has, it has become something of, of value to you. Not because of the physical value, but because of memories and all other sentimental value that you put to it. And unless you let go of that damn chip cup, you're not going to get a new one. You want to see you get a new cup? Let that one break to pieces. Throw that one away. And next thing you know, you're going to get a new one. And then when you get a new one, you realize it's much better. (laughs) Right? And much healthier as well. Right? You have to let go of this old life. However much you, you may like, you know, be somehow attached to some of your ideas and philosophies. That's the deal. Jesus said, if you want to become a new person, you have to hate your life in this world. You gotta hate it. You gotta let go. In fact, you have to die. He said, He said, if the grain of wheat, talking about us, he said, if the grain of wheat falls to the ground and does not die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Right? It's what happens to a seed. A seed must be dead must be dry before it can be fruitful. And you, to become this new person, you have to die. You have to let go completely of this person you have been up until today. You have to say, God, I don't want this, this life anymore. As far as I'm concerned, you can take it. Please take it. I will settle for the new life you have for me. I believe the new one you have for me is way better. So I want to let go. I choose to let go of this old life, the old me. Do you want to make that decision tonight? If you really honestly say, I don't want this old life anymore. So if you really mean that, if you really want that, and you're going to leave here tonight saying, Lord, I want to become a new person. In every way I am, every area of my life. Remember, I asked you to think about every area of your life in the beginning. I want to to change everything in every area of my life according to you. I want a new life. So if you really want, you're you're prepared to do that. And that's going to be a process. It's not going to be magic. But you're prepared to go through the hard decisions And make the sacrifices, cut off certain things from your life, and dare to become this new person He wants you to be. If you are really serious about this, I want to pray for you. Let me tell you now what you're going to do next. Because it's all good and wonderful what you've done so far, what you've heard so far. Okay. But the moment you go out here, what's going to happen? This old life, this old world will come over you. And will try and have you believe that there's no way you can change. Okay? You've got to resist that. You've got to resist that idea in your head. You've got to resist friends who try and tell you it's not possible. Okay? Because the devil will use people to try and make you think it's not possible. All right? Even reminding you of your past. Reminding you of your, of your own mistakes and so on. But you have to resist that idea. And turn back to God's promise. 